Well, uh, continuing with the globalization theme here, uh, from Sydney to Rio de Janeiro, yes. they now have shown stars from Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, people freak out if you don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I know in this room it's the opposite. So I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I do have some numbers to show you. So, <laughs> so and also, I have to show my name, department, and university in order to get them to pay for my flight. So to the administrators of City U, here we go. Okay, should we take a picture of that? <laughs> take a selfie later. So we're almost done with this amazing uh, love fest for Leo Panich. And one of the things that's been consistent with all the praise is uh, that he's very generous with his time and his brain. And this has certainly been uh, my experience with him as well. So I was his student uh, both for my MA and my PhD here for seven years at York. Um, what some people haven't mentioned, which maybe we take it for granted, but he's also very generous with his booze. So when we're on, I think, the fifth iteration of my uh, PhD proposal, he whipped out a bottle of whiskey and he said, okay, let's get through this, come on. And we had, I don't know, maybe five glasses and it was a special whiskey that he brought from India or something. So I, 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 don't even, I didn't even know they made whiskey over there. But So very generous with his time and his brain and also I didn't realize uh, how he reshaped, he literally reshaped the floor plan of the sixth floor. So I, I didn't know that was, that was Leo's doing. Um, and you don't know what you got till it's gone. So now that I'm at City University of Hong Kong, so my, my department is this L-shaped uh, floor plan. There's no common room. So my office is over here, and for the people with offices over here, like, I, I can go months without seeing them, right? So everyone's in their offices. So there's, we, we don't meet, we don't talk, we don't share ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So really, reshaping that space has done a lot for, uh, for, for this department, I think. And, we, and so we all have Leo to thank for that. Um, and of course, I'm also influenced by this book. So oh, I, I also wanted to thank the, the organizers, Steve and Frederick and, and Camilla and, and Greg. So it's, it's been really neat to see how, so we started with his students from the mid 70s yesterday morning, and then going um, more to the present, to, to his, his last uh, batch. So I, I came along <laughs> in, in 2007, um, just when they were, they're, Finalizing the you know the American Empire project, so I was extremely lucky to uh, to be to uh, to see this to its fruition. So the title of my talk is "Can China Unmake the American Making of Global Capitalism?" So obviously playing off um, his his title. And my answer is no, but I'll say a bit more uh, in the presentation. Oh no, I'm, I'm not going to do a PowerPoint. I forgot. Okay, I'm going to do a PowerPoint for myself here. Okay, so. Everyone, I guess, in this room knows, knows this book. Uh, but so basically, uh, their, one of their main arguments is that from the 1940s onwards, the United States sought to establish new uh, relationships, right? So start to integrate the other capitalist powers um, under the umbrella of its hegemony. Um, instead of having, so having the deepest uh, imperial linkages between the former uh, enemies instead of between their, their colonies. Um, and how this, so this created sort of a all for one and one for all. Um, world order, uh, and so, the, you know, so diplomatically, financially, militarily, uh, and through foreign direct investment, so through production, and eventually this would become the transnational production networks that that we uh, that a lot of us talk about today. Um, so, reading their their brick of a book, I think, at the very least, we we realize the extraordinary extent uh, to which what of what the United States has accomplished over the past, you know, 50, 50 60 years. Um, and even probably beyond the wildest dreams of those in the 1940s, right, as they were, as they were planning. So a lot, of, a lot of what they've done, of what they've accomplished is unplanned, um, but it certainly, and it certainly wasn't inevitable and it was entirely contingent. Um, but any country, when we, when we see this process of the, the Fed, so we mentioned the Fed and so on and, and all the other institutions, when we see this process, we realize that any country that wishes to challenge the system basically has to remake the entire global capitalism. Right? So, if the, so if China, for example, wants to uh, challenge or even carve out a space within Asia for its own hegemony, they would have to remake the entire nature of global capitalism. So, just, so it's quite a daunting task and uh, virtually insurmountable in my opinion. Um, but in, uh, in any case, in, in other research I've, I've argued that uh, so with key aspects of the capitalist rise of China actually strengthens this American-centered world order. It doesn't challenge it, it actually strengthens it. 
Um, and I think the capitalist rise of China marks the end of the beginning of the American century. So if you go back to Henry Luce, maybe I'll have time to uh, show you some quotes from Henry, Henry Luce in the 1940s and, and others as well, George Kennan and so on. The kind of world order that has arisen from the capitalist rise of China is, is almost exactly the kind of world order that they were talking about in the 1940s. So the capitalist rise of China and, and the BRICS more generally emerging markets, in my opinion, is the end of the beginning of the American century. But it's not for one of trying. So China is certainly trying to carve out its own niche um, and, and remake certain aspects of world order. So uh, especially with Xi Jinping. So Xi Jinping came to power in 2012. He's, he's last year or two years ago, he's anointed himself as the core leader, right? So, he's, so people regard him as the, as the most powerful leader in China since Mao Zedong. And he's doing a number of things, so both domestically and internationally. So he's cracking down domestically. I have plenty of stories about that, about my friends in Southern China, but also including in Hong Kong where I am. So we still have academic freedom, freedom of speech in Hong Kong, but it's definitely, um, the noose is being tightened now. Um, and, uh, and also, as China is slowing, so China, Chinese growth is slowing since 2013, really emphasizing ethnocentric nationalism, uh, both at home and then abroad as well. So coupled with this, so it's coupled with the slowing growth and so on, so this is becoming sort of a really toxic cocktail in, in, in East Asia. Um, but China has largely abandoned, or at least temporarily shelved, its attempts to move beyond the US dollar system. So you remember in 2009, the Chinese central banker said, we got to move beyond the US dollar system, we got to move to uh, IMF special drawing rights or whatever. Basically, they've abandoned that. So, so what's happened is that Chinese central bank, of course, they've bought even more US dollars, they've bought even more US treasury bills, including uh, this summer, their, their stockpile of T-bills has increased yet again. So they basically abandoned trying to move beyond um, the, U the USD system. And of course, they're not even trying to kick out the US military from, from South Korea. And, and Japan. All they can do is try to save North Korea so that the US military won't go right up to the Chinese border. Um, but ch China under Xi definitely is trying to recenter or at least redirect some trade and investment linkages to China as the hub. Right? So to return to um, China's original role in East Asia for over a thousand years as, as sort of the, the, the middle kingdom means, the characters for China means center of the world. Right? So it's, as the, the, the celestial empire. So moreover, China is still presenting itself as an alternative leader of the global south, so sometimes even with anti-imperialist undertones, but certainly not with anti-capitalist uh, undertones anymore, but sometimes still with uh, anti-imperialist undertones, and certainly as an alternative source of investment from the West. Um, and China already is an alternative source of, of investment, especially infrastructure investment. Um, and so whether, but whether this complements or challenges this American-based system is another question. I think it complements it, it doesn't challenge it, but maybe I'll get into that later. So China is, is attempting to expand or export its post-2008 investment-driven growth model to uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America. So this growth model, so China has grown from this export-driven growth model, it collapsed in 2008, and so China stepped in with the massive um, investment-driven growth model, so huge stimulus uh, that's racked up this, the largest uh, increase of debt the world has ever seen, so it's now 280% of GDP um, from, from uh, just over 100% in 2008. So, but China's been slowing since 2013, so they're trying to export this investment-driven growth model to uh, a, especially Central Asia, but uh, around the third world. So that's one thing that China's trying to redirect. Um, so that's through the New Development Bank, although we don't really hear about that anymore. And it was an originally an Indian proposal in, in, in the first place. But through the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank, and especially through One Belt, One Road. So in May of this year, um, there was the largest con international gathering since the 2008 Olympics for the One Belt, One Road uh, um, con conference, which India refused to, to go. So the, you know, there's still tensions, of course, there. Um, Okay, so, but, so I think that, uh, you know, if it's slowing in China, if this investment-driven growth model is not working in China, or has limits, is coming up to the structural limits, it's not going to work in Laos, it's not going to work in Thailand, it's not going to work in Indonesia. So China can have all this infrastructure, so apparently they, they poured more concrete from 2009 to 2013 than the United States did in the previous 100 years. That's right? so a huge infrastructure. But uh, Laos, for example, they're trying to, China's trying to build a high-speed train through Laos. 
the GDP of Laos is about 12 billion, the cost of this high-speed train is about 4 billion, right? So I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, that, so these one about one road projects are already stalling. In Indonesia, there, it's been suspended. Um, the the high-speed train from China to Singapore is basically suspended. Uh, the one in, from Greece to Hungary has been stopped by the EU because it, it was tendered to state of, Chinese state of enterprise, et cetera, et cetera. So this is already, it hasn't, it's barely even begun, and, and One Belt, One Road is already um, coming up against huge limits. Uh, in terms of trade, we have, so China is the number one trade partner for 124 countries now, and that's from uh, something like 20 to 30 10 years ago. And so it's ba the numbers have basically reversed with the US. So with 10 years ago, over 100 countries had their number one trade relationship with the US. Now it's reversed with China. But we have to ask who's doing this trade? Who's conducting this trade? Or who ultimately owns or profits from this trade? And so this is where some of the data, I'm gonna show some data now. Um, because, so I think in the age of globalization, we can no longer interpret these national accounts. So exports, GDP, uh, sh world share of manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. We can no longer interpret these national accounts the same way we did before the age of globalization, because through, glo through the globalization of production, investment, finance, uh, <coughs> foreigners now own a large chunk of what's going on, um, especially in China. So, exhibit A, this is uh, enterprise type of China's total exports. This is from the China Customs Yearbook which I just found in, the, in my library at CityU. So MIT doesn't even have this. I was just walking around in my library and I stumbled across the China Customs Yearbook, all in English. Um, so these are total exports, so the $2 trillion of exports from 1995 to 2016. You can see the, the foreign invested enterprises um, is still around 40%. So actually as of the last year, 2016, private, <laughs> Chinese private enterprises and, fo and foreign enterprises are now equal. So they count for 40% each. You see the state-owned enterprises have, have collapsed. So of all of China's exports, 40% uh, are owned, are conducted by foreign firms. This is China's process with imported materials exports. This is the global value chain stuff. So this is all the electronics that you have. Um, all the components are, are gathered from different countries around the world and then assembled in China. So this is the most important exports for China's export-driven uh, growth machine. Five minutes. Uh, so, the foreign, the foreign enterprise has actually increased their share from 80% to now 86% since 2013. So 86% of Chinese, of these exports in the global value chains are foreign firms. And so I, I put together this little thing. So these are the top export categories from China. Office and telecom equipment, clothing and textiles, chemicals, including pharmaceuticals. So $590 billion of office and telecom equipment, which is, accounts for about a third of the world's exports. But Chinese corporations only account for 1.6% of the profit in the fourth global 2000. The U.S. profit share is 60%. Okay, so the U.S. profits by, by far from uh, Chinese exports in, in, in the top export category. So including clothing and textile, the U.S. is 50%, while Chinese profit share is 4.7. And I'm, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to have to breeze through. These are the top 10 exporters from China. These are the top 10 firms, uh, exporting firms from China. And only two of them are actually from China. Right? So the rest are foreign. So mm -hmm. Hunai Precision Industry is Foxconn. That's the Taiwanese firm that makes all your Apple stuff. And then they also make for Sony, Dell, all the rest of it. <coughs> so uh, by far, I mean, eight, eight of the top 10 are foreign firms, right? And then this is in terms of ownership. So who owns these top 10 firms? So Taiwan, of course, I don't know why it came out in Hindi or whatever. So that's about, <laughs> that's about 30%. And the U.S., even though there's no U.S. firms in the top 10, Amer Wall Street owns 22% um, of, those, of those firms. Okay, so that's, so that's the trade aspect. So it's, it's, West, it's Western firms that are actually conducting the trade um, between China and the rest of the world. It's not, Ch it's not directly Chinese firms. And then the other aspect is this rise of ethnocentric nationalism in China that is very, very popular in China. Uh, with many, many of my students, my, my students from the mainland, love this stuff, but very, very unpopular outside of China, including even in Hong Kong and Taiwan. So I just want to use this latest movie as an example, Wolf Warrior 2. So this is by far the highest grossing film in China. So it made over 800 million US. It came out just this summer. Um, and it's about an uh, ex-Chinese Secret Service guy, the Wolf Warrior, who saves uh, some Chinese in Africa because there's an African civil war and there's African warlords and chaos and everything. So 
the slogan for the movie here down below is whoever attacks China will be killed no matter how far the target is. And so these are, this is a slogan for this movie. Um, this movie made over $800 million in, Ch in the mainland. It made less than $3 million outside of China, including in Hong Kong. So people in Hong Kong uh, couldn't care less about this movie. They think it's hilarious. Um, this is one of the funny scenes. So the bad guy, of course, is American. So it's a mercenary based, based off of Blackwater uh, in China. And then the wolf warrior, the, you know, they have this big battle at the end of it. The American guy gets on top of him and says, don't you know that white men are superior to yellows? And then the wolf warrior says, that's ancient history, man, and then kicks him off and then, and then, and then beats him up. So it's funny, but you watch it in the cinema in the mainland and they're all cheering, of course. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the final, final scene uh, of a Chinese passport. And on, on the back it says, uh, the citizens of the, oh, sorry. The citizens of the People's Republic of China, when you encounter danger overseas, do not give up. Please remember, right behind you, there is a powerful <coughs> motherland. <laughs> but probably the funniest scene is when they have, to, they have to go through this village, and the two African tribes are, are fighting against each other, and they have to go through it to escape to the ship, uh, to escape back to China. And so he pulls out the Chinese flag, and of course, everyone in Africa loves China, so they put down their weapons, and he's a, he can go through. Right? So, so like, that was the funniest scene for us. I was, I was with two Western friends and we were laughing off our ass and people behind us from the mainland were saying, hey, this is not funny, stop laughing, this is serious. So they love it. Um, okay, how much time do I have? One minute. Okay, so this ethnocentric nationalism is very, very increasingly effective at home, although only for the Han, of course, so the Tibetans and the Uyghurs and then the Inner Mongolians. So I have a student who told me about the separatist movement Inner Mongolia. I didn't even know that there was a, um, a, a violent separatist movement in Inner Mongolia, so her parents are involved in it. So there's, even within China, but then of course in Hong Kong and Taiwan and the rest of, in Vietnam, they have no interest in returning to the era when they pay tribute to the celestial emperor, right? They have no interest in this. So, uh, Chinese ideology, <coughs> hegemony, etc. Total failure. Total failure so far. Um, but China has changed. So we can't say that nothing's changed. So China has changed uh, certain things in certain limited respects. So other countries do have more choices now for infrastructure financing due to, due to Chinese largesse. Um, and so one of my PhD students is, is studying how this has allowed Venezuela and Ecuador and, and Bolivia to uh, implement some of their, their economic nationalism um, and re resource nationalism, although of course that's, that's changing now. Um, but at the same time, China still supports the IMF and the World Bank. So again, it's not challenging, it's complementing, right? So China also gave $40 billion in the aftermath of um, the, uh, the, the global crisis to the IMF. So it's nowhere near, uh, so it's not at all bipolar, multipolar, like, it's not an alternative like the Soviet Union presented. Um, it's, it's more multi-layered now. Um, but, but a definite change is that China is definitely illiberal. Um, China is not interested in implementing American accounting standards, American liberal standards, et cetera, et cetera. They want to maintain their own system, and the Chinese Communist Party will not relinquish power if they can get away with it. So, uh, in the central party school, so all Politburo members have to go through the central party school, seven out of the ten books on the required reading list are about the collapse of the Soviet Union. And Xi Jinping apparently has said that uh, one of the biggest mistakes of the 20th century is Gorbachev's perestroika. And so they're very aware of this history, they're studying it, and they do not want to repeat it. So the Chinese Communist Party wants to maintain power for the next thousand years. Um, and so th they are, for example, they've increased controls actually of state-owned enterprises since Xi Jinping, but including this year. Um, and I pr I'm probably running out of time. So, the, like I said, China's slowing, and I think it's going to continue to slow, and it'll, I think it will enter a deflationary spiral like Japan, except uh, China's demographic problem is even worse than Japan, um, and China is much less uh, technologically advanced than Japan. Um, and the answer to my question, can China unmake the American make it in global uh, world order, is actually on the back of your <coughs> iPhone. So on the back of your iPhones, it says, uh, assembled in China, um, designed in California by Apple. Let's just retwerk that. So the world order, global capitalism, is assembled in China, but it's still designed in the United States. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you.